and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the final talk in our series, Life in the Extreme. Uh, we are leaving Mars and we're going to the ocean today. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Joseph Ryan. He's a bioinformatics specialist trained in evolutionary genomics who comes to us from UF's Whitney Lab in St. Augustine where he is an associate professor studying the evolution of biodiversity and genomics of a wide range of marine invertebrates, including tenophores or comb jellies, which are stingless jellyfish-like animals that we'll be hearing about today, uh, sea cucumbers, sponges, flatworms, sea urchins, sea stars, horseshoe crabs, and others. Uh, Dr. Ryan received his PhD in bioinformatics at Boston University. And following that, he was a research fellow at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH, and then a postdoctoral scholar at SARS International Center for Marine Molecular Biology in Bergen, Norway. This past year, he shared a Distinguished Investigator Award from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, which provides a million and a half in funding over three years to study the nervous system of the invasive tenophore Nemeopsis ladii. And for the previous five years, his NSF funding allowed him to link the phylogenetic and genomic diversity of tenophores to echophysiological adaptations in the extreme conditions of life in the deep sea. So today, Dr. Ryan's talk to us is one billion years of nervous system evolution, evidence from dazzling comb jellies. So welcome, Dr. Ryan, and we very much appreciate you speaking to us today, given uh, what is coming your way in the way of Storm Nicole. So welcome. Thank you so much, Paula, for the introduction and the invitation uh, to speak with you all today. It's a great pleasure. I forgot what my title was, so it was much better than one I sent about dazzling. So it's, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I just thought I would share with you what's going on here. So the lab is closed and um, this was a picture before I left. This is three hours after high tide. So it's heating up in, in Florida. This is my, this is my street. And I wasn't, I was at, this is my, on the right side is my street about 30 minutes ago. So I was like, it was blocked. I wasn't able to go. And I was like, I'm going to have to do this in like a parking lot or something, but uh, <laughs> I'm here at my house, so I made it. Okay, so these, uh, so the question about how animals interact and sense the, the, uh, their world um, and the world around them and how they react to it is something that has fascinated humankind for millennia and I'm showing here a picture of uh, two of the animals that I study. These are comb jellies, uh, one comb jelly that eats another comb jelly. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about this group. In order to set up um, our understanding of why this group is interesting, it's useful to think about how we can divide the animal tree into um, five major lineages. And so I'm gonna walk you through each of these five major lineages and then we're gonna talk about how they're related and why that's important. So this group is the uh, periphera or the sponges and sponges are benthic filter feeding animals. Uh, as adults, they, are, uh, they don't move around very much, if at all. And they create these wonderful homes or like coral reefs for lots of other animals and bacteria and other types of, of uh, non-unicellular eukaryotes and things like this. Um, as a larvae, they are swimming and they actually will find place, you know, they will uh, sense where they want to settle. Um, you can see here's a, a movie of them uh, showing how they will, um, how they filter water and how much water is actually being filtered. You can see here's a giant barrel sponge and you can see the, uh, this dye coming through. And then also here is one, here is a, a freshwater sponge that's actually kind of moving. So you can see how they move and um, they can actually clear their, uh, 
this is slow motion. So they're actually moving very slow, uh, much slower. This is sped up, sorry. So they're actually moving very slowly, but you can see that they have, they're very active in their, um, how they're reacting with their environment. However, these animals lack nervous systems or recognizable neural cell types, and they lack muscle systems. So that's partly why they move and react slowly. The group uh, that I showed you earlier, tenophores, are uh, all marine animals. Most of them um, live in the water column, and they uh, use these eight, these rows of comb cilia. So there's eight rows that go uh, from their primary body axis. And they use these cilia to move through the water column and to create flow around their bodies. Um, and so here, here you can see the, these comb cilia. These animals have uh, recognizable neural cell types and muscle systems. And so they're able to uh, move and react much quicker. Uh, the, the next group is Placozoa, um, and the species is Trichoplax. This group is, uh, are these kind of disc-like animals, flat disc-like microscopic marine animals. Um, if we look at, here's a video of a, uh, of one that's eating fluorescent microalgae. So these animals also lack uh, recognizable neural cell types and recognizable muscle cell types, but they are able to um, also react to their environment and, and move around. Here's, uh, here's them um, interacting with each other. So you see this pausing behavior, it's kind of cool. Let's see if it happens from work from a colleague of mine who's who's a neuroscientist who studies animals without nervous systems. Anyway, it's, those are trichoplax or placozoa. And then there are cnidarians. And these are animals who we're maybe more familiar with because if you're at the beach and you get stung, these, uh, this is a cnidarian that's stinging you. If you know about coral reefs, um, sea anemones, these types of things. And so here are some, ah, See, there we go. Here are some. Uh, on the left is a is a box jelly, and then on the left, uh, in the middle, and on the right are uh, true jellyfish. So these are cnidarians, and these animals have you can see their muscle system working that um, as they're beating for swimming, and they have uh, clear neural cell types. And did I have a video here? I did. Oh yeah, check this out. This is cool. I just like this one. This is a soft coral and uh, it's a colony and it's about to, this is also this slow life. This is from just, these are sped up videos as well, but these animals are really spectacular. Purple. Yeah, pretty cool, soft. These are uh, found in the deep sea. Here's um, a video of a uh, sea anemone, pretty sure. Could be a coral. Yeah, this is nice. This is pleasing just to look at. So I'll let it run. Oh yeah, look at that. These are pretty cool, fascinating animals. Cnidarians. And then there are bilaterians, which are everything else. Uh, so there are things that we're used to seeing like giraffes and, uh, well, I didn't need that one. Uh, giraffes and primates and things like that. But then there's also, uh, you know, more marine life like those guys, or like then it, there's a lot of weird stuff also in the bilaterian. So like the sea cucumber, for example, is a pretty spectacular animal. But all of these animals, like cnidarians, have clear, recognizable neural muscle cell types, et cetera, because you know, obviously we are bilaterians as well. And so, okay, so that brings me to the question of how are these five lineages 
related. And for the longest time, morphology really drove how we thought about the tree of life. And, um, and bilaterians, cnidarians, and tenophores, three groups that have you know, muscle systems and ner nervous systems were thought to be most closely related to each other. And cnidarians and tenophores being you know, jellies, gelatinous animals with tentacles living in the ocean, blah, 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 were thought to be closely related. I'd say the people that studied tenophores always were like, tenophores don't look like cnidarians at all, but you know, more general invertebrate zoologists really plumped those together, bilaterians, cnidarians, tenophores. And then the things that shot off earlier were sponges and placozoa. With the onset of uh, DNA sequencing, it's, uh, this result kept coming out with tenophores actually branching off earlier away from the cnidarians, so not grouped with the cnidarians, and this group placozoa actually being more closely related to the uh, bilaterians and cnidarians. So placozoa is cl more closely related, but we still had sponges as the sister group to the rest of animals. And then in 2008, uh, the first phylogeny to incorporate many genes uh, from many animals, including a tenophore and including non-animals, recovered this tree with tenophores as the sister group to all other animals. And at the time, especially at the time, most people thought this was just an artifact result and um, that it would eventually get put, tenophores would get put back in their place, right? Uh, but let's see what's happened since then. There's been a lot of different studies from a lot of different groups that have recovered the same result, right? So some of these people were actually trying to figure out where tenophores would go, but other people just threw tenophores into the tree and they cared about other, they were looking at other questions. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, my work is, in, some of my work is included in this list, but uh, there are many groups here. And then, but there have been, uh, studies, many of these studies reanalyzing the data on the top panel and suggesting that there are problems, artifactual problems with how the data is being analyzed. So um, they, these nine or 10 studies would recover uh, sponges as a sister group to the rest of animals. And so there's been kind of this pong game going back and forth between this idea of tenophores as a sister group or sponges as a sister group. And uh, this in 2017, Antonis Rokas, who's one of my favorite phylogeneticists, he basically called this the mother of all phylogenetic controversies. So basically, um, you know that phylogeny and evolutionary positions on the tree are things that can be really heated debates. And this one is currently the biggest one going. And you could see in this uh, article just a couple of years ago from uh, the New York Times, um, there is a battle raging in the tree of life and that there are a lot of people that really hold on to this idea that sponges are the sister group. Uh, and there's a lot of people pushing that that doesn't seem to be the result. And, you know, if you've studied the philosophy of science, you know, like this change of ideas uh, or scientific revolution is one that takes a while to happen. So we are 15 years into this controversy and really still in this phase of, of some people being on one side and some people being on the other. So anyway, why do we care about this question? Well, phylogenetic trees are fundamental to understanding evolutionary processes and the evolu in particular, the evolutionary processes that are driving biodiversity. Um, and if we infer evolutionary processes on an erroneous tree that will lead to an erroneous understanding of evolution. So we we want an accurate understanding of how things have evolved. So we it's very important to establish a very robust tree uh, of life. Okay, so as an example, um, as one of the key examples is what about the history of neurons? So we talked about how bilaterians have neurons, cnidarians have neurons, and tenophores have neurons and placozoa and sponges lack them, right? So with the tree based on morphology, the classic tree, um, this becomes a very simple problem from a parsimony standpoint. 
So the most simplest explanation for this data is that the last common ancestor lacked a, a neural cell type and that the stem ancestor of bilaterians, cnidarians, and tenophores, in that ancestor, the, this cell type came about, right? And this is a gradual thing of, of how things happened. Um, if we have, if we look at this tenocis tree or with tenophores down here as a sister group, then it becomes a little bit stickier because we either had a neuron in the last common ancestor and then it was lost twice. And this is something that doesn't sit well with many people. How could you lose a nervous system, which is the one of the most important things to how, you know, for, for humans, like without our nervous system, what are we, right? So we have a hard time thinking about how you could actually lose a nervous system or there was no nervous system in the last common ancestor and that it arose twice. Another thing that's pretty remarkable to think about, you have two independent lineages creating this incredible uh, way of sensing the environment, right? So what do we know? So in order to really understand the question, we have to know something about the tina for nervous neuromuscular system or nervous system or muscular system, right? So what do we know? We know that they have this nerve net, and we've known this uh, really since the 19th century, that um, there is a, a network of, of nerves that are in the epidermis or just under the epidermis of these animals. We know that they have synapses and neurons in expected places. So we know, um, uh, and this is also very old work based on electron microscopy um, from the 60s. Not very old, but it's been around there for a while. And then um, they have a muscle system uh, that's throughout their body. And, and we also have genomes from all of the animals. And from the genomes... We have, we have genomes from four of the 200 described species. Uh, from the genome, we know that they had a lot of the components um, that make up the nervous system. So here I'm showing uh, on the left side are the myogenic components or components involved in muscles. And the ones in red are ones that weren't present are not present in tenophores, but all the ones in blue are present. And on the right side, I'm showing uh, some genes that are involved in the post synapse. Um, so the um, the an important component of the nervous system. And you can see that the ones in blue are ones that the tetaphores have and that all other animals have. And then the ones in yellow and orange and red are things that are not in tetaphores. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of genes that are present in tenophores that are also being used in the nervous system of other animals. Um, we, uh, and so we've also have single cell RNA-seq atlas. So each one of these dots represents a cell and it represents the readout of the genes that are being turned on in that cell. Um, and so they've been clustered with an algorithm that puts genes that are, that cells that are expressing very similar types of genes at very similar levels together into groups that are uh, meant to approximate a cell type, right? So you can see muscle cells down here, uh, digestive cells down here. One thing you'll notice is that some cells, some cells are annotated, but there's a whole group of cells that are not in this study. But uh, Following up on that study, a, a couple papers, including one that I was involved in, the Babonis et al. paper, um, where we were able to find um, out of their cells that were not labeled, we were able to nail down that those cell types were almost certainly coloblasts and tentacles, which are cells involved in their tentacles. And then this paper, uh, very recently looking for neuropeptides, we're able to show that many of these cell types that were not annotated are actually neurons. 
And so we can go back to that atlas and start filling in some of the blanks. So we have we have a lot of resources with the genome now and the atlases. Um, and so with all these resources in hand and what we know about the nervous system, there have been, you can see um, listing uh, most of the citations that I'm aware of, this argument that neurons and our muscles arose convergently in tenophores and other animals. So this is a growing thought is that as we become more comfortable with tenophores as the sister group to rest of animals, the two different hypotheses about when did the nervous system come about, um, this is the one that seems to be gaining in popularity is that this thing arose, that the nervous system arose twice. Um, and so what are the implications of a convergent evolution of neurons and muscles? So that means that the ancestor did not have a nervous system, right? These cell types were not present in the last common ancestor. And, uh, and that the neuron, uh, and yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. It was, they were not present in the last common ancestor and it arose twice, right? We've talked about that. So what are the arguments for this, uh, for this part? And the arguments are that there are specific genes that are very important that are absent. Uh, um, so many of the many of the genes are there, but sub subset, and that subset is so is very important uh, to make a neuron. So that is one argument. A lot of the specification genes, especially uh, so the transcription factors that turn on other genes that are going to become a lot of those even more so than the genes that are actually involved in the, in the process are um, going to be different between tenophores and other animals because tenophores don't have some of them or they're not recognizable. Um, muscle cells and presumably neurons as well, although it's harder to record, uh, actually record uh, directly from those cells, it's easier to record directly from muscle cells, who, which also have some of the same properties of, of neurons. So muscle cells are not sensitive to things like GABA, histamine, acetylcholine. So these, trans, these neurotransmitters that are common in our nervous system don't seem to affect cells, uh, excitable cells in uh, tenophores. Glutamate is the one exception. So glutamate does seem to be present. And the synthesis of those transmitters are not in the genome. So those synapses, so those seem to be things that happen later. The markers, there's, there's a couple of genes that have been used to, uh, to mark neurons in many, many different animals, including like clams and humans, right? Our nervous systems all have these same, these markers are being expressed. So these are thought to be panneuronal markers. In tenophores, early 2015, this paper in 2015, said that th these genes are not expressed in neurons based on these in situ hybridization experiments, and they seem to be expressed in different cells. Um, and then they have this nerve net that's really weird. So they're, it's an anastomose nerve net. So it's just a very few cells that are all syncytium. Like so there's no synapses connecting cells of the nerve net to each other. There are synapses of the nerve net to other neurons that are not the nerve net, but the nerve net itself is very strange. <clears throat> and so this is used like, this is used also as evidence that this is so weird compared to other animals. Skip that. And then they, the synapse itself is a very strange structure. And so the, um, the, they point out that this is unlike other animals, synapses, pre-synapses, you have um, synaptic vesicles, and then you have the, elect, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and then you have the mitochondria all kind of smashed on each other. And this, apparently is something that we don't see in our nervous system or other, other uh, bilaterians. 
it's also um, the synapses can actually be uh, two way. So you can have um, the same, usually our nervous system is polarized. So a, a signal goes out of a cell into the next cell and you'll, that cell, will, the cell that emits the signal will never receive the signal in the same, in the same place as it, it's emitting. So tenophores don't have that. They have uh, non-polarized neurons. I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so counter arguments for this. The argument that these neurons are weird rely on the fact that they're using markers of neurons to say these are neurons. <laughs> so uh, this recent review that just came out says that nerve net neurons express genes important for neuronal functions. And they include, including signal transmission, electrical excitability, polarized secretion, and neurite outgrowth. So here they're showing a lot of things that the neurites of, of tenophores share in common with uh, the nervous systems of bilaterians and cnidarians. The pan-neuronal marker um, was also cited in that same, that same review, but if I look in quickly in that atlas, what you can see is the ELAV, for example, is expressed in sensory neurons. Um, and that's the highest cell, that's the top uh, meta cell that's expressing uh, that marker. So it is expressed in neurons. And Musashi also is expressed in neurons. The top, the top cell is this special cell called a coloblast, which actually we think descended from neurons. Um, but plenty of cells, plenty of neurons are expressing Musashi. So that argument, I think, doesn't carry weight. Um, this idea that the specification genes are absent um, is true, the specification genes are absent, but if we sequence individual muscle cells, and from those, what we see are at least the effector genes are all being expressed. So genes that we ex think are, are, are definitely typical for bilaterian muscle, actin, tubulin, myosin, tripomyosin, calmodulin, and then also myosin, light chain, light chain kinase, titan, nebulette, annexins, all of these genes are amongst the top most expressed genes in muscle. The nerve net is weird, but we also see the same situation in flatworms. So acial flatworms and nemertodermatids, which are related flatworms, they also report to have, there's work in the literature showing that uh, they also have anastomosed uh, nerve nets. And um, also nerve, the nerve net is not the only set of neurons in tenophores. So we're studying some of the other neurons to see uh, are they, you know, are they weird or are they not so weird, right? Do they, do some of the other neurons look more like the neurons in cnidarians and bilaterians? And that seems to be the case. Uh, the presynaptic triad that I talked about, this weird thing that when I first saw it, I was like, what, is that, you know, what does that mean? That also, had, there's a similar structure in cnidarians as well. Um, so when I first came to, to the Whitney lab, uh, Peter Anderson was the director there and I was talking about this. He's like, oh yeah, I see this. Uh, and he showed me his paper from 1988. He's like, I see the same thing in jellyfish. So did the turnifor nervous system evolve independently? I would say yes. The ancestor was likely a billion years old, right? So animals have probably been around for a billion years. And when they split, tenophores have been evolving independently for a billion years, right? So many, there's lots of weird things that can happen in a billion years. Uh, but I would say um, you could look at other groups and say, yeah, of course, they've been evolving independently as well. You know, chordates and annelids, for example. Uh, maybe just not as long, and that's why their nervous systems look a little bit more similar. Um, is it reasonable that the tenophore neurons independently co-opted co all of these things? Voltage-gated calcium, sodium, potassium channels, 
uh, genes that are involved in synapses, chemical synapses, um, and these were, you know, all these receptors, et cetera. Uh, and then what about if we look outside of animals? And so we see a lot of the same characteristics of excitable cells um, in, in non-animals, right? That are fairly distantly related to, um, to animals. So here I'm showing a dictostelium, which is an amoeba. Um, some recent work there that looks pretty exciting that when these animals, when these organisms come together in, to form a multicellular uh, mold, they are actually sending signals to each other um, in a very fast, cool way. So what the question I would ask you all is like, what would true convergent evolution look like? And, and what does true homology look like? This is a question I think that's plagued evolutionary biologists for a long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole thing of like bats have wings, birds have wings, insects have wings, but clearly when we look at what's underneath those wings, when we look at development and we look at genes, we see that these are, these are truly convergent structures, right? Um, there's similar situations with limbs and skin and things like that, but does that are we dealing with that kind of system or or do we have enough evidence to suggest that yeah these these are shared these come from a shared ancestry so uh yeah this is a slide that this is <laughs> this is this uh this more questions i threw in from a previous talk so i just gave this talk to our uh to our group at whitney and yeah so thank you very much Well, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, I'm looking to see uh, if anybody's got a question. Um, if not, um, I do have one question. Um, so from what I understand, the tinafores um, are fairly ubiquitous in the oceans, but they can occupy different areas of the ocean. Is that correct? So we can find them in the deep, deep oceans. And so are you finding um, any differences in uh, nervous system development um, in say the real deep ocean dwellers versus maybe some of the more surface uh, dwelling uh, tinafores? Yeah, the, um, so I, I did go on a deep sea expedition and I was hoping to be able to, to get some embryos, but I, but I realized that was a quite naive thought, um, you know, it's like getting embryos out of an animal that you've never got them from is usually like, it's just luck if it happens. Right. But um, I think like, here's a deep sea one. These red ones are, are uh, usually in the deep sea. I don't think there's going to be much difference. I mean, they they have the basic structure. Um, the only thing that's really different about them is they are much more fragile because of the pressure that they're under. Uh, and I would imagine that their nervous system is tuned to that pressure as well. Uh, but all in all, yeah, that we don't know too much about the deep sea because they're really difficult to study. Yeah, I, well, I was just going to ask how how do you do sample collection <laughs> if you, if you want to ask that question? How, how I mean, uh, is it a uh, a matter of uh, getting space on a uh, a shuttle of some sort that you have to head down there and somehow collect samples, or and then I imagine them bringing them back up uh, so they can be studied is a whole nother issue as well. Right. Uh, so the I went out with my colleagues at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, research institute in in Monterey, California, and um, they have a ship that has a submersible. Um, it's not it's not a manned submersible. It's a uh, connect. It's uh, driven from the ship itself, and on that ship they have these collecting things. So these animals are fragile. The deep sea animals are extremely fragile. So basically you have this tube that goes around the animal and doesn't touch it at all. And then the, that tube will get closed like this. And then when they come to the surface, everyone runs in there, grabs those, tries to get them uh, 
settled into a into a um, calm environment. But studying them is is the, you know studying them is 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 a challenge because I transferred one from one dish to another very very softly, and just the rim of it going from that rounded rim was enough to like explode that whole beautiful red tinafore that I had. So, wow. Yeah, I, I I would imagine, you know, that if you discover that, you know, it's from a, at least from a genetic standpoint that, you know, genetically they're similar, but epigenetically, you know, is what you would be interested in looking at with deep sea pressures and whatnot. Um, and, and the different challenges that they might have for things like feeding and, um, interactions with each other, how to find each other, <laughs> I guess. Uh, Paula, you know. I have a question here in the Oak Room. Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Okay. Uh, Joe, this is Jane Brockman. Um, yes, I was asking, I was thinking of similar sort of questions. What are they doing uh, with this, these muscles and um, nervous systems? Uh, do they have eyes? Do they uh, I actually tried to collect some one time and discovered that they can, they can run away from you. Uh, <laughs> so um, I don't, but I don't know how they do that. I don't know how they recognize. So are they, do they have, yeah, what kind of receptors do they have? What sort of, and, and what are they doing with these muscle nervous systems? Hello, Jane. It's great to, uh, great that you are here and um, it's great to hear your voice. The, uh, yeah, so they, um, they don't have eyes. They do have opsins, which are, you know, the classic uh, photoreceptor genes, um, receptors. They, we are doing some work on um, this, on the surface of these animals, they have these bumps or these sensory papillae and the, um, those papillae are sensitive to vibration. They're sensitive to uh, chemicals. So they're chemosensitive and they're also light sensitive. So we're using that as a model to kind of try to understand how, uh, um, how the animal senses its environment. But clearly these things on the surface of the animal and also we're looking at tentacles as well. These are the types of things that there's gonna be predator prey uh, type sensory systems that are going to activate. And so like one thing, like one uh, common behavior is when they will get something stuck to their tentacle, they will actually like twist their body into, uh, into the tentacle. So that food will then get stuffed into their mouth. So, you know, I mean, if they're using their nervous system, I think for the same thing that, uh, that, that everyone is, that we're all using our nervous system for, you know, eat and uh, stay alive and reproduce. Right. Thank uh, you. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. And Bob, yeah, you're unmuted. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Joe, I had a question that you're, there's probably not much in the fossil record for jellyfish. I presume they're not well preserved. But I, I wonder, my question is, what would be the evolutionary uh, pressure to evolve differently? Or is simpler better? I mean, if they have this network of nerve cells that can operate silly and they feed, what, what more do they need? What, what, what is the evolutionary pressure or, or any evidence that they are evolving now? Yeah, uh, good to see you too, Bob. <laughs> Um, and, uh, the, hmm. I, I assume they don't need to allow self-awareness and, uh, lots of other things. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, all that stuff is, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you can look at, a, at, um, a flatworm. And so we have a tendency to put animals on the, you know, on a ladder and with us at the top and um, and things like sponges and things at the bottom. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the one, I think, let's see. 
<laughs> I think this is why we struggle with this idea of maybe, which is my my hypothesis that sponges and placozoans lost their nervous system. And, and so you, I think we struggle with like why you would need it. If you have it, why would you lose it? But what do they do? I mean, they're doing, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself as far as um, like why they would need it. But I think there's weird, evolution produces weird things. Uh, even animals that are closely related to, to, to humans, right? Like echinoderms. Echinoderm nervous system is weird. Echinoderm development is weird. Uh, there are things that are other things that are also deuterostomes, tunicates, for example. Um, it's basically what works, you know, what what works in the in the environment that they are. And I think the tinafores really have an affinity for the deep sea, and perhaps a lot of what we see in in more shallow waters are things that descended from the deep sea. So maybe the deep sea has really had a big mark on their nervous system. Okay, another question here, Paula? Yep, go ahead. i just like to add that um, out east in the China Sea, some of those uh, animals that we've been looking at that you're studying are extremely dangerous. And uh, they, uh, they do use their uh, tentacles sometimes to capture something that they w would like to eat. But they, some of them are extremely dangerous. And I think it would attack someone's nervous system and send you to the hospital if you ever brush up against some of them. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, that though the very dangerous ones are actually the cnidarians. So these animals are these animals don't have those cell types that cnidarians have that are actually little harpoon little harpoons with packets of of neurotoxins, right? Um, called cnidocytes. So these animals don't have that. So they're they're not very dangerous. Yeah, I've got a I've got another question. Um, and I think I was reading um, that the tenophores, I, I think there's some issue with invasiveness in some of the European um, inland seas or waters. Um, and they're, uh, they're creating problems for some of the fish larvae. Um, is, is, that, is that sounding familiar? And, and what, is, what, is, what is the issue with that group of tenophores versus the open ocean. Um, what, why is that such a problem there? Right, so the group that we study the most here in St. Augustine, and actually our dominant predator species out right out here in our, um, in, in the river out here in the Matanzas River and in the, in the coast, in the coast uh, is Nemeopsis ladii. And actually, when my pool floods happen many times will probably happen tomorrow, my pool two out of the three times it's flooded has been full of nemeopsis, right? So these animals, and, and when I first look, I don't see them and then they just multiply like boom, 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 boom. They'll, they will produce thousands of embryos. So they are able to really like, uh, you know, when ships are at the dock, they're everywhere. These, these animals are everywhere and they will take them up in their ballast water and then they go across the ocean and then drop their ballast water. And then these things thrive, right? And they don't have natural predators, at least they didn't in the eighties. Um, and, and, and since then that Baroe that I, that I have that video on here of the Baroe eating other tinafores, that one has also been introduced, which has kind of made it so that Nemeopsis, because I think in the 90s, this was a huge question in Europe, like what is going on? And, and it was crashing fisheries and things like that. And it seems to have um, 
come there. See, there's Baroe eating a Bolinopsis, which is very close related to the Nemeopsis one that we study here. So I have a, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and there was a couple papers showing that the ones in the north, for example, in the North Sea and these colder waters are actually Nemeopsis populations that come from colder waters in the U.S., like Massachusetts, uh, and the ones in the more in the Mediterranean and some of the south, more southern um, environments in Europe come from populations that are in Florida and around in those areas. So there seems to be this structure. There seems to be some limitations on uh, thermal limitations on where these animals can go. And I have a group that's actually uh, a, a, a have a, a postdoc that's actually looking at the populations of the of the Atlantic, um, the Western Atlantic, so the the U.S. Uh, Atlantic, and below to see what are what is the populations and what are some of the limitations that these uh, animals are under, and that has Im implications for their. Uh, and, and so, so they can only thrive in um, salt water. Is that correct? Not brackish or, yeah. Bra well, brackish to a point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're in Matanzas, which is uh, sometimes below 20 parts per thousand, but so uh, they're so, doing well. So your pool must be a saltwater pool then. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. Okay. That's, what, that's what confused me a little bit. Okay. Uh, do, are there any other questions? Um, Julianne, anything in there? Okay. Well, we will let you go because I know you have got a lot to get ready for. And uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it, it was uh, a real pleasure. And your videos were amazing. So I <laughs> really, really enjoyed that. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to see you all. All right. And I hope everybody enjoyed the series. And I look forward to seeing everybody next year. <laughs>